Pinellas County, where you at? Welcome to another episode of Green's Gridiron Exchange. I'm your host, Coach Green, and tonight, man, you're in for a big surprise, a big treat. Um, we've been uh, talking about this young man uh, for all, you know, throughout the week. Um, big guest tonight, and we're just excited to be amongst you. So, um, again, we're just excited. Special shout out to Totem Pole Nation. Um, again, and as you guys get ready to jump on, make sure you hit that like, hit that subscribe. Um, all of you guys coming in, make sure you also uh, hit us with the questions in the in the chat tonight. Um, there'll be a lot of good things that's discussed, but never mind that. I want to bring in my co-host, Royce Willow. What's up, brother? How you feeling tonight? Well, everything good, man. Everything good. Just getting ready for this. Last week of football, and uh, oh, just yeah. ready to get this thing going, get these playoffs. We got um, a good guest coming up tonight. We got a couple mm -hmm. guests over the next couple weeks. So I'm um, just excited to get this going. We on YouTube, so make sure you go to our YouTube, like, and subscribe. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you go to uh, Total Pole Nation, like, and subscribe. You can also support us on Facebook, get us some stars. Like I said, man, we're just trying to get some hardware for these kids and do some different things. So um, that's what everything is going to be used for. That's what all the support is used for. So um, once again, thank you all for that. But, um, yeah, just another week. and We're all ready to go. What's been going on with you? Oh, man, just been excited to see uh, coming down the stretch of how uh, these teams are going to fare out. Um, if you guys haven't seen um, Pinellas High Media Group, they posted um, – potential in some locked uh, playoff uh, opening games for the playoffs postseason games. So, uh, man, just excited to see um, the teams that advance to the postseason. And um, I'm ready to get – this is, like you said, the second season um, is beginning after this week, uh, after this following this week here. So, um, man, it's, it's just big things, big football. And normally guys start to, uh, you know – Rev it up a notch, you know, um, you know, the, the regular season they got through, but now it's time to really hone in and, and play big boy ball. So that's what I'm really excited about to see how these teams fare um, in the second half of the season. That's right. That's right, man. So um, right now we're going to go over our top 10 real quick before we get into the show. Um, of course, we got the usual suspect CCC. They've been up there. Since uh, week two, have not came down yet. They're nine and zero. They have a big test coming up. Then we got Calvary, also with the big test coming up. They're sitting at seven and two, even though they're um, lost two games. They lost some pretty close games, some pretty good teams. So um, they're still ranked number two. Then we got Largo, number three, eight and one, coming in off a big game from Jeremy Thomas. We got Tarper Springs, eight and one as well. Um, probably the best, you know, the best, the most, you know, the biggest season as far as turnaround. Um, coach Freud, probably, um, probably for, for best coach, honestly, um, with them going eight and one. I mean, this team was in a totally different position last year. Uh, we got St. Pete also um, not as big of a turnaround season because they were a good team last year, playoff team, but still doing a great job at seven and two. Then we got CAI with a big test this week, huge test against Venice. I mean, and this and Venice is loaded. We're gonna talk about that. Um got Palm Harbor seven and two. Uh Palm Harbor's just um they're they're like Largo. They're just an all around great team. Uh when I watched them last week, the ball control was excellent. That you know when I saw that's really the difference with them. Um they're gonna drive, drive, drive on you to they're ready. Will Sieber's gonna do what he has to do. Everybody on that team does what they need to do to get to where they have to go. Then we got Northeast coming off a big win from P Park. Um, they, they showed up big time, big time. We told, we said we needed to see some things from Northeast. We saw some big uh, special teams plays from a um, young Inman. Uh, we seen some big plays from Javion McKenzie over the last three games. I believe has like 240 receiving yards. Uh, Worley showing up. Um, Northeast is showing up and they're doing what we said we needed to see. 48 points was big against a uh, strong Pinellas part defense. So um, they're still there, number eight. Then we got Indian Ross Christian who crept in there at six and three against the LaBelle team. 
And then we got P Park sitting at five and four, still looking like they're going to make the playoffs. Uh, but they're they're in there, man. And um, this week they're going to see are they going to be five hundred? Are they going to go ahead and uh, go six and four and um, end this thing off the right way? So, um, what you think, Greenwood? How did your top ten look? Um, of course, like you had, uh, like you would say, the, the the same usual suspects from um, at least one to five. Um, all of those guys proved to be up there in the top five. Um, and then coming down the stretch, uh, I think the only, you know, maybe guys that I switched around, um, I don't think I had CAI as uh, high. Maybe I did. Um, but from everything that it looks, you know, it kind of gets jumbled up. You see you have uh, Northeast at six and three. Indian Rocks at six and three, Pinellas Park at five and four. And those three teams right there, you know, coming down the stretch, it was, uh, it remained to be seen which direction they were going to go, you know, and, um, you know, a couple of players had missed a few games. And I think that kind of hurt um, the teams down the stretch. Um, as far as Northeast is concerned, um, I think that, um, they're still a tough team, um, only has three losses, so I think that's a good spot for them. Um, overall, I can't be mad or argue with the top team, and I think that, uh, you know, pretty much it played itself out well. You know, the way the top ten kind of played itself out like I would, like I thought it would coming down the stretch, um, I think it's pretty much spot on. So, um, you know, I have no complaints about uh, the top ten, so – all right, yeah, and as we see here, we got somebody saying they still like Clearwater better than Northeast. I mean, it, 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 it's an argument. It's an argument for that. It's an argument for that. But um, at the end of the day, um, it, it came down to at the end, um, Northeast has been is winning in the end. Now, as far as you know, Clearwater P Park, that's really what it came down to for me. Right. Um, did I want Clearwater being on P Park, and we know that P Park. Be Clearwater, correct? Right. So, so at the end of the day, that's what it came down to as far as them being in the top ten. But um, you know, Northeast has won at the right times. It has been all about timing. They beat a uh, they beat a good P Park team. You know what I'm saying? A P Park team that beat Clearwater. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, right, you know, right. um, it, it, you know, it, 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 it's it's crazy how this goes. But at the end of the day, um. That you know, that's what it came down to. I want you know, I looked at number 10 spot as far as P Park and Clearwater, and I saw that you know, that that's just pretty much what it came down to winning at the right time. So, uh, mm -hmm. I you know, I definitely agree. Clearwater is still a good team, they're looking like they're still going to be a three seed in their region. So, um, you know, they still are going to have the opportunity to, um, to possibly show that they could do some things. Um, so let's see. We um what we're gonna go over next is um we're gonna go over our player of the year candidates real quick. Let me go ahead and get them up. Um yeah, a lot of teams, even though they didn't uh what's going on? Uh what's going on, bro? Zan, how you doing, bro? Zan, um, what up, <laughs> yeah, man, good dude. He was my son's coach at P Park, man. Them boys, uh, I made a post about them yesterday, man. Seven D1 players. We had an ESPN five star. We had Keely on there. I mean, we had some dogs, but that year I think, man, we allowed twenty eight points that year. All little league, see, the whole year, bro. Twenty eight nice. points. Yeah, yeah, they showed up, man. So uh, shout out to Zan, man. Shout out to the coaches that was there. Them some good dudes, man. Um, give me one moment. We go get these uh, candidates up, man. Uh, so for the player of the year candidates, man, we got all. Uh, it, it, it hasn't shuffled too much. It's up, man. Newton, he's uh, showed up in number two. And we got Severlano in number three, man, who's been coming in with 62 tackles for loss. He's been a dog, man. I'm talking about yeah, a dog so at the D-line. He was a dog last year, uh, but the coaches went ahead and voted uh, for someone, for um, Tamion, actually. So it was up to the coaches. But um, let me see. So, so did Clearwater beat P Park, bro? I, I want to say as I was saying, I was like, "Yeah, remember they didn't have um the two running backs." Right? Oh, that's right. Clearwater did beat P Park. Yeah, they didn't you, have you're right. Uh, you're right. You're right. Or, you're right. Uh, you're right. So that that that's that's my bad on that. It was something else that made 
the side clever. I mean, P part though, and I gotta I gotta think of back to what it was, man. But uh, let me see. We got somebody else with a comment real quick. Lakeland killed Largo and CAI beat Lakeland, but they're ranked six. What is your reasoning? This is the thing about it is I could bring CAI up. I could have brought CAI up, you know what I'm saying, just off strip of schedule. We kept them number one, even though they had two losses. But at the end of the day, you got to respect winning, period. You know what I'm saying? CAI did beat Lakeland, which put them back in the top ten. Because at, the, at at that point they were they weren't even they were just getting to four hundred or just getting over that point, so that was the reason why. But CAI, of course, we you know what I'm saying we know that you know what I'm saying they're a very talented team, but we have to respect the fact that Largo has not lost. You know what I'm saying they went on the winning streak. They've done what they're supposed to do. You know what I'm saying CAI, like I said, they came back strong. They they came back strong. They jumped in, but um at the end of the day. Um, and even in, even in the FHSAA rankings, I don't know. I don't think they're back where they should be. You know what I'm saying? But uh, they're still highly respected. You know what I'm saying? Um, so um, so that that's just at that point. But I think um, even with that Clearwater thing, I don't I don't know whether it was due to the district. I don't I don't know whether it was just timing. I don't know what it was, man. But uh, we go we go we gotta actually get back to that. We go we go talk about that because I'm I'm gonna figure that out. But um, as far as the Player of the Year candidates, man, we got Jeff Jones, um, number one. Um, he's on that road to two thousand two hundred eight yards away. Um, right. We got Newton, Newton. Newton came in, man. He had a perfect game. Um, even though it wasn't for 300, 400 yards, the fact that he had, I believe, had over 160 yards, that has to be respected because, you know what I'm saying, with Jeff, I believe he had six passes. He only had about nine yards. Newton, he went out there, he threw, you know, these are that's over 20 yards of throw, actually almost 30. So he went out there and he threw some balls and he was perfect and he did what he had to do to get some wins. So, Newton has to be respected in that sense last week, even though Jones had high rushing numbers. Um, I still respect Newton in that sense. Uh, we got I got seven on number three. Uh, how do you feel about the just the first three, Green? Um, I, I like uh one and two. Sevalano is 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 definitely a beast. Um I I had to uh man, it, it's like you say, bro. Is each player is is playing not based on the the player the candidate uh, player of the year candidates because whether they watch the show or they don't they still going out there to borrow so really if you look at the stats I don't think Sevalano is saying I got to try to be the best I can be to to get player of the year candidate but when I say all that to say that they're doing it because they want to win and that's the hunger so. You know, from that standpoint, it's hard to argue not number three or why he's not number two or why he's not number one. Um, so, again, man, all of these young men, um, especially Jeff, um, and I, I keep going back to Jeff just because when you turn on the tape, it's like you left almost with your mouth open. Um, I haven't really watched – much tape on Sevalano, which I need to, but the stats speak for itself. And with the caliber of teams that Sevalano has played, those numbers are outstanding. You know what I'm saying? Those numbers mm -hmm. speak out of what type of athlete he is. Um, not only that, but Notre Dame doesn't just recruit anybody. They going after the top of the the top of the line, just like anybody, any other school, but Basically, creme de la creme. They trying to get the best athletes possible because of the prestige, uh, you know, the prestigious university that it is. And for Sevalano to have that just speaks, again, of what type of athlete he is. So um, the top three, man, any one of them, you can shuffle them around. Sevalano could be number two. Jeff could be number two. Um Shawnee can be number three. I mean, like you said, coming down the stretch and all the way to the playoffs, man, it's any man's race right now. All right, 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 man. And then with Raymond, um, his first game under 100 yards, of course, we're not penalizing him and taking him off the list. It's just that, you know, them boys, the first three guys had some great games, um, but he's at almost 1,600 yards. 
probably not going to get that 2,000 because he's playing, like we said, he's playing against some prospects this week. Venice is just, that, that's what it is. But, um, and then we got Drakkit down there from Calvary. Drakkit is the pure pass of the group. Um, a lot of games where he didn't play the second half, you know what I'm saying? Um, but, you know, in any county, man, he might be, you know, be the top, but, you know, he, he, taking nothing away from him. He he is an excellent player, so we just want to go ahead and um, throw that out there as well, man. It, you, you know, if if someone came and said, who's the best pocket passer, Drac is probably going to be the one that, you know, we, we, we say as far as that. Um, yeah, the level of competition Newton plays is much higher than Jones, but like, the, you know, the comment said, Jones does a lot more with less and the thing about it is Jones surrounded by a lot of talent, but Jones did the same thing last year. He did the same thing last year, all right, with less because he has a lot of sophomores and juniors. So this is the class he came up with. So last year he played with nothing but sophomores and a couple guys that were older, and he still was voted by the coaches as the offensive player of the year as a um, 10th grader. Then in ninth grade, almost 700 yards rushing, coming off of JV with just a couple games. So Jones' resume, if you look at his if you look at it it, 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 it speaks volumes, you know what I'm saying? Newton does play a lot of high competition. And think about it is St. Pete, like I said, St. Pete has a lot of talent. Don't think that, it, you know, Stinson, Ducksworth, um, they have a good line. They got um, Sloan. They have some good players. Don't get it twisted. If you go watch St. Pete play, you will see – I would not be surprised if they don't lose any more than two games next year. You know what I'm saying? So um, take a look at them. But, yeah, definitely um, CCC definitely has that comp, man. And uh, the thing about Drakkit is you can definitely argue uh, with Drakkit at third. You know what I'm saying? Um, Drakkit is it, just that it is – I, you know, he, it's just, man, Jones and Newton and all these guys, they just showing up. You know what I'm saying? It's just everybody's showing up and putting up big numbers, man. And it's really, I really did, didn't even have to put a number on this. I could have just, we could have just made a list, you know what I'm saying? And um, it, it still, it still would be, it still would be tough to pick. Uh, what, what what you say about that, Green? Yeah, um, these are some good, you know, valid points that uh, all of our listeners are bringing to the table. And uh, back to the, the Jones and um, Shawnee, you know, just kind of wanted to touch on that real quick. I would say that if Shawnee played for St. Pete and Jeff played for CCC, would they be doing the same things? You know, uh, from Jeff's standpoint, I think he would still be putting up the numbers. You know what I'm saying? From the standpoint of putting them, if he gets put in the right position, um, you can't hide talent. And he's just flat out better right now than everybody on the field. Um, would Shawnee be putting up the numbers at St. Pete if he was at the quarterback position? Maybe he will, maybe he wouldn't. But as far as um, him returning kicks and punts, uh, I don't know if that would be a strong suit for, uh, for Shawnee if he played for St. Pete. Um, now, can he do it? Yes, but to the fact and to the effectiveness as, as a Jeff Jones, I, I, I don't think so. Um, and this, oh, my bad. And then lastly, I would say, Shawnee never runs, uh, I mean, uh, Jeff never runs out of juice. If you look from quarter one to quarter four, <laughs> it's like the same film. Like, like you can't tell on his film if the run was in the first quarter, if it was in the fourth quarter, because it ain't no drop off from how he's playing through all four quarters. And, and that's what I like about, uh, that's what I like about Jeff. Um, right. You know, go ahead. Go ahead. Right. And I think that, man, this is the thing about it. If you could give Shawnee Jeff speed and swap that and give Jeff Shawnee size, I'd be, mean, it, you know what I'm saying? They both could swap out qualities, man, and you would still have just two great players. You know what I'm saying? Like it, so, and, and even with New, I, I've never seen him run out of juice. I can't say I've never seen him run out of juice. I can't ever say I've seen him. 
I mean, I, I've never seen I've never seen a run out of juice. And you know, Jeff is just he just it's just he's more he's gonna have that ball a lot like it's a lot more on his back. But um, I can say with Shawnee is is he I've never seen him get tired, man. Um, he stepped up. He's played defensive end when needed. He 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 he, he a dog, man. It's just Jeff. It's just he ha, it, he's quicker, faster. It, he's more of a highlight real. But with Shawnee, it's more business. When he goes out there, he does what he needs to do to get um get his team those wins. So um. They, those are definitely some good players, man. So uh, we go, we go, we go pivot the conversation a little bit because uh, we got our guy here. Um, so we are just gonna introduce him real quick. I saw a couple weeks ago where he came in, and um, I, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know. And uh, he came to me on Twitter, man. And of course, everybody, you know, I don't follow a lot of people on Twitter. And um, I was like, okay, we got the Largo offensive line coach. Then I saw his resume, and I was like, oh man, Largo. He's an asset to not only Largo, but this is an asset that we need to have for the county because not only is he bringing, um, you know, something to the winning culture at Largo, but he's also doing some things outside of that that a lot of linemen need um, as far as his uh, group TC3 performance. So um, I definitely wanted to get him on the show because just like Preston, he has, a, you know, he has a story, you know what I'm saying, to tell, play for Duke. Played for a couple of NFL teams, so we definitely had to we definitely had to get on there, man. Get him on here. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and bring him in. All right, I'm I'm good with names, bro. So I, but but I'm not the greatest. So I'm gonna this. So is it Tacoby Cofield? Yeah, yeah, you got me, Tacoby. All Cofield, right, so we got man. my brother, brother Cofield here, yeah, man. And um, I just want to say, man, I appreciate your time, man. And um, Absolutely. thank you for coming on. Thank you for coming on. Definitely appreciate y'all for having me. Uh, it's a great opportunity. I love what y'all doing, man. So um, great things, great things coming about. I'm glad that y'all uh, even got this open and got this going, man. So this is big. It's pretty big. All right, cool, man. I appreciate that, man. Uh, so first question is, of course, like I said, man, you know, you are an NFL player. You, um, how, how did, you know, what, and you played for Duke, of course. So what was your journey in high school? Where you from? Um, what, how was, how was it a high school? Was it a, you know, easy transition for you? Were you always a good student? How, how was that journey? Um, it's funny you say, were you always a good student? Cause if you ask my parents, I was average. Um, but if, you know, being able to get a degree from Duke and being able to get into school, um, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. And it's pretty tough to do. Um, but I'll say this, um, I was bad at football for a long time, man. Um, I come from a little bitty town called Tarboro, North Carolina. Um, it's in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, I think at the time when I was living there, when I was in high school, we had about 11,000 people. I want to say it's probably down to a probably six or 8,000 now. Um, my high school was a two A high school when I played. Um, we're all the way down to a one A high school now. Um, I also, but saying that, um, I, I love it here and um, I love the state of Florida just because y'all breathe football, man. And, and that's what my hometown breathes. Friday nights, everything is purple and gold. Um, everything revolves around my high school and high school football. Um, very similar to this area, very similar to the state. So um, I felt at home. Like I said, when I got here, I was terrible, uh, terrible in football early mm -hmm. on, um, mainly because um, the beautiful thing is they have things like LJP. They got the little, um, was the little Spartans, different little devils. They got so many different programs that you can play in now without a weight limit restriction. Um, I'm 31, so I kind of came about that era when there was the weight limit restriction. And fortunately, I was in, I want to say, the first year I tried to play was third grade, and I want to say I was already 160. So I was having to play up a whole age group. My mom wasn't having it. Um, then when I actually got a chance to play in fifth grade, I was still slightly over the weight limit. Um, but I was I was close enough that they let me play. Um, but we only had four local teams in the city. Um, so we pretty much played against each other every week, just a different team. And then, you know, you go into the playoff bracket and it's really just two, three teams, two teams playing and then a championship game. Um, but what the one thing I can say that it did is it helped us understand, A, who the good football players were. Um, and B, who was going to be great once, you know, moving forward and kind of getting into high school and, um, 
I, I couldn't play in sixth grade. I was way, I was, I think I was like 215 by sixth grade. Um, I had blown up. I was like five, seven, five, eight, two fifteen. Big kid, um, and just didn't know how to play football. Everybody wanted to put me on the O line, D line, and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, seventh grade, made the team. I think I was one of only five seventh graders. We uh, we didn't lose a game at, uh, in middle school. So um, kind of like they got the 14, 13, you here. We didn't have that. We played middle school ball, junior high ball. Um, and my middle school, we didn't lose a game. So all those athletes that played together in the Pee Wee League kind of moved into middle school and we were dominating. Um, so the city knew we had a special team. We had special players. And kind of looking back at it, I laughed because uh, Todd Gurley went to my high school. He's from my hometown. Um, big, big, big fan of Todd's. Uh, however, everybody's like, man, I know you blocked for him. That was great. I never blocked for Todd one day um, in my life. Uh, he was on JV for two years. Uh, he's an amazing player, amazing person. Shout out to Todd, man, um, and everything he's done for the city, for for literally for himself, his family. I love him to death. But we were loaded. Um, and the fact that he could play two years of JV and we could pull him up two years in a row, um, and he returned kicks and punts for us. And that was it. Um, the superstar we had was my uh, my cousin, uh, D-Hop. He, uh, he ended up going to play D2 ball for a little while. And um, and we ended up having two, three more workhorses that were just as good, if not better than Todd at that time. So we didn't have to even push him in the game early on. We had time to kind of let him grow, let him matriculate and, and, and kind of go from there. But um, I said seventh grade, I didn't play, didn't get in the game. Eighth grade, I broke my finger, didn't play the season. Ninth grade, I was terrible, didn't get in the game. So I went to a football camp over the summer um at the university of north carolina believe it or not and they saw me at my size i want to say i was like 6'1 275 at that point as a freshman they were like man dude, you're big but i was playing d line they were like yo you need to come play o line so they they kind of transitioned me um and it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me i kind of came out of that situation they told me they keep eyes on me um i was alternating with our starting left tackle at that point he was a senior um and the good thing about it is he wasn't a bad sport he was literally looking at me like dude if you take this spot you take this spot like we gotta do what's best for the team um which i was grateful for as a young player and by the third game of the season i was a full-time starter the fourth game of the season i got my first offer from the, uh, east carolina university um and it kind of took off from there um by the end of the season i want to say i was up to maybe six seven offers by i went to four different junior days my junior year by the end of my junior season i was up double digit offers um and i ended up choosing duke um mainly because it was different it was the the one place that was kind of different than my hometown it was a different area and i really really wanted to solidify myself as something different um when me and my teammates me and the guys that have been kind of been together playing for so long we first got into high school as sophomores we lost in the first round of the playoffs and they wanted my coach's head they wanted them fired because everybody had watched us since we was in peewee they knew we were special it was like man you ain't doing it right nothing's going right get rid of them they retained them and um thank god coach craddock jeff craddock great dude great man great coach um and our junior year we went to the state championship and lost and we really took that to heart, uh, really took it to heart. We walked back in the weight room, walked back on the practice field. And we had one thing in mind. That was to get our ring and then hold that trophy. And we did it. Uh, we did it. We went out, won a state championship my senior year. Um, and that kind of mantra of going from bad to good kind of shows up a lot of different places in my career. Um, when I got to Duke, it was the same thing. Three and nine, notoriously bad by my red shirt sophomore year we went six and six played cincinnati played in the first game, uh, bowl game since 1994 by the end by my senior year we were ranked um and now you kind of see them ranked again and you see the thing you see things are just kind of still rolling down in durham um and and you know i i call coach elko i'll text you know the staff down there and tell them how great you know i think the job they're doing but that's also what kind of attracted me to duke is the opportunity to establish something, like I said, and do something special, start something different, start and going from there. And, you know, like I said, even when I got in the NFL, I went undrafted, you know, I was kind of down in the dumps about that. I thought I was gonna get my name called. I went to the combine 
and went to the Redskins. And lo and behold, we win the con. We win the division. We won the NFC East my rookie year. I get cut the next year. I go to Seattle for a little bit. Then I go to Oakland. I'm in Oakland. Lo and behold, many years without going to the playoffs, we go to the playoffs when I'm there. Um, so it's like I said, it just it just kind of kept following me everywhere I've been. It's been kind of this winning that kind of just kind of takes off after a little while. So um, I'm blessed for that, that everywhere I show up, you know, we kind of win and things yeah. go well. But it's been a it's been a it's been a wild ride as a career, man. You know, different things have happened, injuries. So, um, but yeah, I'm blessed to be in the area and and as an offensive lineman that kind of started to showed up early on and I wasn't good. I knew what it takes to get good. I knew what it takes to improve. And I know how to kind of work with a young guy and kind of bring him along and a guy that might not have the confidence right because I've been there before. So um yeah, man, I'm I'm like I said, I'm excited to be in the area and excited to be around here. Great, great, great man. Um what inspired you to go ahead and be a coach once your career was over? Um, I guess you could say I, I, my dad more than anything. Um, my dad coached rec, ba uh, basketball and baseball all my life. You know, when I wasn't able to play in the league, in the football league, we just kind of turned our attention to baseball and to basketball. And he always coached me and I always saw how much of an impact he had with so many other guys, so many other talented players, you know, and he always taught me learn everything. If you know what everybody does, then you're an asset to not only the team, but the coach, because now he can rely on you out there to kind of direct traffic. And um, I, I, I own that. And and the more I owned it, every place that I played, every coach that I've played for, I've tried to be that guy that he could rely on and trust out there as a player that could, could help coach and help, you know, direct traffic when we're out there. And, you know, it just kind of helped me navigate into coaching and, I, I coached my first year in 2017 at Nightdale High School. Um, Coach Anthony Timmons gave me an opportunity while I, I was hurt, tore my ACL, and wanted to stay in football, and, and I fell in love with it. Um, and haven't looked back, haven't even considered doing anything else. Um, I love it. Hey, cool, 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 man. And uh, Green, you had a question you want to throw in real quick? Or you... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put him on a hot seat, you know. Um, Thank you again, Coach, for joining us, man. Appreciate um, you coming on and just sharing all this good stuff, good knowledge for the listeners and the young players out there. Um, the question that I wanted to to touch on is to go back to your recruitment process. Um, mm -hmm. How many visits did you take? Number one, how many visits? And out, do you have any crazy uh, visit stories? Stuff that something that happened on your visit. That could have swayed you or could have told you, like, nah, I'm definitely not going here when you went to some of the schools. Um, I so I took I ended up taking unofficial visits. Oh man, I took them almost every weekend. Um, mm -hmm. especially if I knew it was the school that liked me. I just wanted right. to show up and keep showing up. Um and and kind of before I answer this, I also say this. So um I help guys with that. Um, that's one of the biggest things I do. Um, guys that want to get in the transfer portal, guys that have an opportunity to go play college football, I leave myself open as a resource, mainly because I coached at the group of five level for the last two years previous to this. So I know what goes on in those rooms. I know what they talk about. I kind of know how, what it takes to get your name and your face out there and start to get the attention. So um, trying to I guess you could say advise guys what to do in order to make that happen. I, I try and, like I said, leave myself open as a resource to do that. Um, but as far as visits, yeah, every weekend, oh, me and my dad would sit down mm -hmm. and plan out like, hey, let's go here. That's going to be a good game. But the other thing that I would do is on every visit, I would try and get cool with a player because that player is going to tell me what that program is really like. And I would try and make sure that it wasn't a good player. It was just a guy that was there, a backup, mm -hmm. because that backup, if he hates it, He's going to tell me he hates it. He's going to tell me why he hates it. Um, so unofficial, man, I was somewhere every weekend. Official, I only took one, and that was the Duke. Um, mm -hmm. I played for Coach Cut, and his mantra was, when you make a commitment, it's like marriage. You don't go visiting around the different women once you're married. So mm -hmm. you made mm -hmm. your commitment. I was stuck. Once I committed, he was like, you here. You go make a visit somewhere else. That's on you now. Right. I might pull the scally. So – I was like, all right, coach, it's fair. Um, 
our official visit to Duke, I'll be honest with you again, like I said, I've been a part of some special groups. Um, we were different. I'll be honest with you. My whole recruiting class was just different compared to the guys that was there and even the guys they brought in behind us. We were just different. Um, we we had a blast. I'll put it like that. We had a blast yeah. that weekend. Um, yeah. It solidified all of our commitments that weekend. And we <laughs> Together we had all collectively picked the right place. Um, gotcha. One thing I one thing I will say though is, and I try and tell, like I said, young men that are trying to make their commitment and taking visits. I tell them this: if a school ever feels compelled to talk bad about another school, that means they don't have enough good things going on where they're at. So I always say that if you negative, if you bash another school in recruiting, you probably don't have enough good things going on where you're at. And that's why you've run out of good things to show and help that young man understand what he can do and what he can be a part of. So I try and advise guys like, hey, they they being they bashing another school. They first off, that means you worried about the other school. Second off, that means you ain't got enough good things going on. So be weary of schools like that. Be weary of coaches like that. And um, believe it or not, it's it's shown to prove pretty you know pretty legit. Uh, as guys go on visits and they make commitments, they they tell me the truth. They'll be like, yeah, coach, he was right about that. He was negative and he just kept being negative. So, um, right. yeah, recru recruiting was fun. Visits was fun. Unofficial visits was a blast. I just made, like I said, I had fun doing it, man. Every weekend, catch a new game, hang out in the locker room. I had a blast. Cool, cool, so, cool. Man. So let's look at the um, one more question for him, um, uh, coach. Let's look at the the flip side of that. Uh, is there anything, not so much that you regret, um, but is there anything that you may have would have done a little differently from the process? Because I hear a lot of guys, even though they committed, they get that sense of people are in their ear to say, you only get this process one time. Um, you only get to commit to one school one time. And, and you need to go and visit you know, other schools, even if you commit it, just to kind of see what's out there, just to kind of, you know, enjoy the process pretty much. Um, do you think you missed out maybe on an opportunity to maybe have seen something else somewhere else? Or did you know right off the bat that, man, or like I said, do you have any regrets when you look back on it? Um, I guess I look at it. I look at kind of my process this way. And I, I'll say this. Um, I didn't I, I didn't come from a whole lot of money. Um, my folks didn't have it like that. Uh, that's part of the other reason why I went to Duke because I was like, I'm about to be around some kids that's got it like that. Like I ain't never been around this. I ain't never seen this before. I'm seeing G wagons and Beamers in the in the and I'm like, oh, that's nice. Like I seen one of those my whole life, as opposed to hey, I'm used to seeing Honda Accords and Toyota Corollas everywhere. You know, that's yeah, just yeah. what it is. Yeah. So um, I, I I really. I really, I would say regret wise, um, not really, uh, I, I, looking back on it, I'm, I'm, I was happy with my decision. I, I guess, I guess I was like most kids after you got to school, that's when you, when we lose a game, you think in your head, dang, well, what if I would have went here? But what if I would have went there? Would it have been different if I'd have been on this sideline? If I'd have been here, would I have been a better player? Would I have gotten the game faster? I, I, I kind of went through that and I feel like every kid does, but um, in hindsight, the one thing I will say that I would have done differently is I would have probably invested more time in understanding the game outside of what we were teaching at my high school. Um, I knew our offense and our defense like the back of my hand. I could tell you all the calls. I could tell you why we were doing what we were doing. But that hurt me when I got to school because I went to a spread offense, quick pass game. We out there taking pass sets and I'm going to be real. We threw the ball 13 times in 16 games and won a state championship. We never threw the ball. Yeah. It was third and 18. We running it and we running it behind me and everybody in the stadium knew it. You're aggressive every play. Every play. And it's downhill, North South football, the whole yeah. game. And because of that, I struggled in the transition to pass protect, understand pass protection, and even understand defenses that are playing the spread offense. It's a whole different situation. You got different things you got to defend. I was used to 
nine people in the box, RPO, nah, we running it. We running it. I dare you to tackle me. Like, I dare you. I might take my guy and run him into three other dudes because I know they got all 11 in the box and they don't care. And our coach don't care. He's still going to look at us and be like, nah, run it. So I would say that is is my thirst for the game was there, but I really invested a lot in our scheme and our offense. And I wish I would have looked at more. I wish I would have understood more so that that transition to college football would have been a little easier for me. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So you come down to Largo. Um, historically, you know, this is a this is a great team. Um, the culture, you know, what I'm saying the culture. Um, as, as as long as I've known Largo, they've always and just did, like I said this year, it's all you know. It's always been about the team. Everybody shows up. You might get a different player showing up every Friday, but you know, overall, the team is going to show up. So, you know, you come here, you you know, you see, you know, I'm pretty sure some solid offensive linemen. What was your approach as far as them and uh, coaching them? And, you know, how did you feel about, you know, coming into a positive culture such as Largo? Um, well, you speak about that. And the first thing I want to give credit to is, you know, Coach Knox and Coach Pascal, um, both of them. Uh, Coach Knox, overly prepared. That's the first thing I say about him. Overly prepared, a workhorse. He gonna work. He gonna work. He gonna work, and he gonna he gonna know you darn near better than you know you. Um, and and you know, Coach Pascal breeding that culture there at Largo, being a former player there, and then coming back and, and continuing the tradition. Those two things, walking in the door with two two guys like that, two guys that have have helped build that program and helped build this area. Um, I, I appreciate the heck out of them um, for welcoming me with open arms. And I guess when I guess you can say when I showed up, um, just being somebody that's recruited the state of Florida in college football, um, I knew I was going to see speed. I was number one out the box. I knew there was going to be speed everywhere. But I knew just from recruiting kids from Jacksonville all the way down to the Keys, the you get a big body, but you get a big body that's not necessarily polished very well, not coached up raw is what we usually call them. And that's what I saw a lot of is raw. I saw the potential. I just saw raw. And I knew again, from being a, a bad player at that position for the time that I was, there was little bitty things that I could just tell one or two guys to kind of shape up their game. And I, and I always try and use the, the analogy of, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I just want to make it roll a little better. Um, I'm not going to change your game. I just want to help you understand who you are as a player so you can play better, so you can have an opportunity to be better. Um, and like I said, man, Coach Coach Nars, Coach Pascal, both of them open arms, welcome me in, and they both looked at me and said, hey, if there's something you can implement, change, if there's something you feel like we can do better, by all means, tell us. Like, we want to know. We want to be the best. And um, I tried to, you know, be a bystander and just watch and learn. And like you said, that that culture, I wanted to learn. I wanted to see, okay, why do we do these things? What is this about? What is that about? That about? And after a while, I kind of got the gist of it. And it was like, okay, I can add this thing. I can add in that thing. But I, I'll be honest with you. The greatest part is I saw a lot of carryover from my hometown. Um, a lot of carryover. And that mentality of hard nosed tough football, that mentality of next man up, uh, kind of what you were talking about, that mentality of somebody got to make a play, it's going to be us. Um, and that's the expectation there at Largo. And um, like I said, it, it, the carryover from the crib, the carryover from Tarboro, so much of it, and it just made it easier on trying to help these guys, like I said, play downhill football, play tough, be a tough, be a tough player, but also be an efficient player and know how to play the game and not waste energy and waste time, especially when we playing against good players and good competition, because there's a lot of good defensive linemen in this area. A lot of, like I said, a lot of speed off the ball. So it's things that they got to deal with and trying to help them understand how to block it and what they can do and what strengths they have. Um, and even the schemes that we get, you know, and, and different coaches run different things around here and them understanding why a coach is doing certain things and, and it helps us play a little bit better and helps us function a little bit better. Cool, cool. So you got your TC3 performance. I know, you know, so we're going to touch on that real quick. Um, what is the philosophy behind that? And how do you feel like it benefits offensive linemen? 
Uh, so I the the philosophy behind TC three is uh, I think I said it earlier. I tore my ACL in 2017 when I was with the Ra uh, Raiders. Um, tore my ACL. It was my first. Uh, yeah, first no, major yeah, injury. You listen um, to no, if, no, my my froze for a second. Sorry about that, but. <laughs> um nah it was my first major injury man and it, it just kind of it was tough to deal with and i had just had my son uh titus uh his nickname's trey so that's where the tc3 comes from is the uh my my is my son's nickname trey me him and my dad all have the same initials um and honestly when i was rehabbing my knee it was just a tough time mentally and physically for me um and i was in durham i was back in durham rehabbing my knee at duke and I really wanted to kind of pay it forward, I guess you could say. Um, and by paying it forward, I wanted to make sure guys knew, hey, hey, look, I'm here, I'm available, let's polish up, let's get better as offensive linemen. Because if we elevate our play, then the defensive linemen are gonna have to elevate theirs. And that means other offensive linemen in the area are gonna have to elevate theirs. And overall, the play in the trenches is just gonna elevate. And you know, if the trenches are better, the teams are better. So now that turns into more college coaches are starting to come to the area and pay attention and take kids. And now we got a whole system that done grown from a few kids that started training and working out in the dog days of the summer and just showing up and just coming back day after day after day. So um, I use the I use the motto protection as a lifestyle. Um, and it's an all the time thing. I want you to protect yourself. I want you to protect what you're doing and I want you to protect your brand because that's who they are now. You know, NIL is a thing. It's, it's real for all of them, but also protecting that quarterback doesn't just mean going out there and doing it on Friday. Protecting that quarterback starts in the summer. Protecting that quarterback means you protect who you are in school and making sure that your grades and your academics are right. You protect who you are character wise because you don't want to go out here in the community and do something that's going to jeopardize you on a Friday or jeopardize you in a long term situation. So I try and really coerce that that protection as a lifestyle. And um, on like I said, on top of that, you know, a lot of the, the values and morals that I teach my son, I wanted to try and be a mentor and be a resource for a lot of the guys that, that I work with as well. Um, and I've come into contact with. Um, and I really believe that my time in college football really helped develop a lot more of the things that I have. Like I said, um, you know, it's, it's not just the training. It's the whole mentorship of it. It's the, men, it's the mental side of it. It's a lot of it. Um, and that's helping guys understand that things aren't going to go great all the time. Things aren't going to be perfect. But how are you going to respond to adversity? How are you going to respond to these different things? Um, and, and the earlier and the faster they can learn those things, the faster that they can protect themselves. And like I said, everything around them. So um, that's kind of my philosophy and where I went with it. But um, I don't just do O-line training, man. I I, I literally leave myself. Go ask you about that. Um, yeah, I'm just going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's crazy. My phone has been going crazy. I'd probably say for the last two weeks, because like I said, I help a lot of portal guys. So, this time of the year, as it's getting closer to the end of the college football season, there's guys that are in situations they don't like. There's guys that are in JUCO. There's guys that are in rooms. And, you know, college coaches will call me and say, hey, this young man isn't doing that great. He's going to need a change of scenery. He's probably going to want in the portal. Uh, I'm going to tell him to call you. And I'll call him. I'll talk with him. Um, and then from there, I'll start to make my contacts. I might eval his film. I'll look at it. And from there, I'll know pros and cons and probably know who to call and where to call them and try and, like I said, get them some more attention. And from there, I try and set out a plan to say, hey, look, we need to focus on this, this and this. You got to get better at this, this and this. Your film shows these things. Coaches want to see this. You're going to have to go to this type of situation. Um, and I try and bridge the gap again for the college football coach who might not have all the time in the world to deal with all these recruiting in the transfer portal, but also the young man who is trying to find a better situation and one that'll fulfill his needs as well as the college football needs. And so that each side gets what they need. Um, so it's, it started out as just something real small, man. And, and, and it's blown up into so many different aspects and so many different lanes. Um, shoot. I even got the apparel now. Um, we make the custom apparel, any different colorway um, and uh, different guys will go out, different guys that I've worked with, uh, 
guy that I coached uh, last year is at uh, Oregon now. Another guy I coached last year is at Auburn. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a lot of different moving pieces and different players. And, and like I said, I try and leave myself open so that these guys, as they have success, as they grow, whether they play in the NFL or they go on to be a husband or a business owner or whatever it may be, I want them to know, hey, look, coach is always here. Coach is always, you know, it wasn't just a football lesson. It was a life lesson that was taught. All right, cool, man. We're going to hold you about, about 10 more minutes, man. Got a couple more questions. So you, you, how often do you guys meet up at Largo Central Park? So right now it's every Sunday. Um, every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., um, between 9 and 9.30, we'll get started. Uh, some guys trickle in. Um, a couple guys need rides that I know, so I'll go be picking them up, and I, we might start at 9.30. But it's an every Sunday venture. That's the way I do it. Um, I'll leave it at $10 again. I told you, I ain't come from much. So $10, $40 a month, you know, every Sunday, my parents would have been like, cool, yeah, I'll take you out there. That's no problem. Um, and, again, I'm, I'm – I try not to do it to make a million dollars. I want these kids to make millions for themselves and their families. Um, and it starts literally on that Sunday where they, they start to train and they start to hear speech and they're put into different situations. And a lot of guys' bodies is beat up now too, just at the end of the season. So I try and do some mobility, flexibility, yoga stuff just to help open your hips up and helps the recovery process and help guys get better. Hey, cool, man. I got one more question. I'm gonna see what Green got for you, man. But um, can you um, let's see. What I mean, as far as we all know, this is not a glorified position, man. So what? Um, let me see. What I mean, what are some of the common challenges that offensive linemen face? Um. Uh, as far as just high school or college and um how do you work with them as far as what you do to overcome those challenges i know you went over it a little bit but how do you work with them to overcome those challenges so um that's actually a really great question um i i'll say this majority i, I across the board literally from seven you all the way to pros um a lot of it is confidence and a lot of it is walking up to the ball and feeling confident about what you're doing um that's the biggest issue across the board now that usually turns into like a an awareness issue and it comes from them not being aware of who they are as a player if i'm a big strong mauler that doesn't move my feet well I probably wouldn't do well in outside zone because I'm going to get beat. But in a gap system and in an inside zone system, oh, I'm a luxury now. You love me. So helping kids understand that and just helping them understand who they are within the system, who they are with, as a player. Um, I'd say another huge common issue, and, and I battle this more during the summer and the off season than I ever do during the regular season, is just pass protection and understanding how it works. Um, like I told y'all, I never pass protected in high school, which I feel like is a luxury to me because any kid, whether you play in a wing tee, whether this is your first year playing football, I can teach you and I can show you and I know what things to reference and how to kind of talk to you because I came from not knowing what to do. And I came from not knowing what to do as a college football player in pass protection and had to figure it out and learn it. So I'll say that that that's probably the second thing is, is uh, yeah, confidence. Well, third, yeah, confidence, self-awareness and pass protection are easily the three main things. And um, I try to I try to combat pass protection. The least coach things in football is the eyes. Um, and that's what gets defensive players beat almost every play is bad eyes looking at things you're not supposed to see. Um, as an offensive player and an offensive lineman, is seeing things you're not supposed to see, seeing too much, but them understanding where to put their eyes, what they should be seeing, and what they're seeing to help them make the block, how they need to make it, what makes it easier. And again, like I said, every kid's a little different, so I try and cater to what that kid already does good. 
and I try and hone in on that and I try and help them hone in on that. And once the confidence is there, once mentally they're good, shoot, man, the sky's the limit for most guys. Sir, yes, sir. Green, man, you got anything before we let my brother go go do his thing? Uh -huh. Nah, actually, I was going to just say, man, um, let the people uh, that's watching all uh, the young men, let them know where they can find you as far as like social media or being able to follow you, you know, if they wanted to get in contact with you. Definitely, definitely. Um, so just like it's on the screen, underscore TC3 performance. Um, the good thing is literally if you put my name in, if you put it into Google, all my stuff will pop up. Um that's the gift and the curse of playing, you know, professional football. I can't hide. Um, I'm, I, I can't hide. I'm out there. So, um, again, underscore TC3 performance is my Instagram page. If you go on there, every time we're doing a workout, I try and post it. I, I've had a few parents, few people that have been like, well, you don't post it until Friday. Well, I usually try and post it on Friday because that's usually the time that people want to look and see what's going on. And they getting ready for the weekend and getting ready for the game. And then that way they go, OK, you know. Sunday that he having a workout. Let's go there. Let's do that. Um, and I also emphasize this. And and, and in reality, um, when I was when I started this in North Carolina, you know, it was with four high school kids. I ended up going and working with uh, the North Carolina Elite Dark Horses. Um, good dude, great dude, CEO of that um, president, my guy Danny. Um, and literally, it was seven U to twelve U, and I had all those kids. Um, and that's honestly, that's what I cater to. And I cater to those kids and I cater to that age group because that gives me the maximum amount of time to work with them. Um, mm -hmm. So if they want to work again, if you're a parent, you, you say, OK, my son plays, you know, offensive or defensive line. I love it when the kid is 9, 10, 11 years old and he's coming out there to me because now I have time to slow it down, break it down and teach it to him. But um, but yeah. Like I said, underscore TC3 performance. Um, you get on my Instagram page. Again, it should link you everywhere else. My Twitter. Um, you type my name into Twitter. All my stuff will pop up. My, uh, my my personal page, as well as TC3 performance on Twitter. Um, if you want to get up there, again, by all means, give me a follow. Shoot me a DM. I try and get back to people as soon as I can. Um, if it's anything about the training, even if it's, hey, coach, you uh, can you watch my film? I probably got 300 of those DMs right now. Um, and I try and go through and I try and watch everyone and I try and give them feedback. Um, again, I, like I said, I try and be a resource for kids and resource for parents just because, like you said, it's not a glorified position. And it's not a lot of people that know what they're doing with it. And it's not a lot of people that even know what it should look like sometimes. Um, so uh, it's, 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 it's been cool, though, man. It's definitely been a cool journey. And I, and I love working with these young men and, and love growing these offensive and defensive linemen around. Sir, yes, sir. Well, man, we appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, we finna get to our second part of our show. We finna talk about some teams and do our thing, bro. So uh, we definitely appreciate you coming on, man. I know you brought some fans with you. So, um, so man, once again, man, salute what you're doing over there at Largo. Good luck to you boys in the playoffs. Appreciate and, uh, you. Appreciate we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking to you soon, brother. Definitely, definitely. Thank y'all for having me on, man. I told Coach, I told Coach Pascal, I make sure I let everybody know where I'm at, man, and uh, yeah, shout him out, man. Yeah. So, hey, we're going to try and keep making this run and keep making it go, man. So, uh, like I said, I appreciate y'all, and uh, y'all keep your eyes That's out cool. for as many things I got going on. There's going to be some stuff popping up here soon. This summer, I got a lot of stuff in the works for the company to help the young man around. So, um, yeah, I'll be coming on to see you, Coach. My son, he he playing man, and uh, he plays um he plays some D one football man. So we'll be coming out there, man. I'll be bringing a couple kids out there, and uh, we'll be seeing you on a Sunday real soon. Perfect, perfect. I appreciate y'all, gentlemen. Yes, sir. All right, coach. man. Thanks a lot, brother. All right. I make sure I, I get with you, Coach. Um, I make sure I send you my contacts. Um, I also had a son has a son. Y'all y'all beat him up pretty bad. He plays safety for Lakewood, so uh. Yeah, man, but he's an 11th grader, and he'll be uh, probably coming to do some of those workouts as well. So, okay. but yeah, man, appreciate you, boss. Definitely, definitely. All right. Yeah. All right, I'll All talk right, to y'all later. All right. All right, please. All right, man. All right, so we go. Um, we go. We took that was a nice interview, man. So, but we gonna oh, go yeah. ahead and jump oh, yeah, into man. um 
we're going to jump into yeah. some of these teams, man, um, real quick. And we're going to start off with um, Dunedin versus Palm Harbor. Um, of course, you know, Palm Harbor, another down season. They, they've been down probably the last two seasons, but uh, still a positive team. But uh, as we were talking about Palm Harbor as a team, they're just, they, you know, they're just very powerful. So we expect this to just be uh, something where probably rest a lot of players, any players that are hurt, um, mm-hmm. you know, play some younger players such as, you know, of course, Renard. Um, they got some um, – the younger Burbert, he's um, a younger guy. He's on the underclassmen list. So they'll probably get a lot of young guys in, man. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, they want to go in with the win. So I expect Palm Harbor – to get a win here. Oh yeah, absolutely, man. Um, Palm Harbor definitely will try to get as many young guys um, some playing time. You know, um, especially the young men that they may have brought up from the junior varsity. Um, and, and as you had on your list, probably a, a boatload of those guys, uh, JV young guys that um, that can definitely play. And so uh, I like uh, Palm Harbor in this game. Uh, this Friday against Dunedin. All right. Um, we got uh, number two, Calvary at Holy Trinity of Pittsburgh. I'm going to let you go ahead and if you see what, yeah, what, kinda, you, what you want to think. Yeah, kind of touch on this real quick. Um, Calvary, they ended up winning the district. Uh, for all of you that did not see, uh, a lot of them, uh, Calvary was, you know, able to hold on and, and, and clinch the district. So shout out to them, district champs. And um, Holy Holy Trinity um, is a is a school that is going to come and try to test Calvary. Of course, um, you know Calvary is also another team that because they've clinched and, and clinched the district district champs. Um, depending on how this game go, they may want to try to get some guys in, um, some young guys in, and, and try to get those guys some some uh, action before they head into uh, the postseason as well. Um, they've been one of our top teams all year. If I'm not mistaken, stayed at number two the whole time, um, you know, for a majority of the weeks. But uh, I like them as well against Holy Trinity. Um, you know, I hope that they can go in there, take care of business and get out of there healthy because, uh, you know, again, the second half of the season is really going to start after this week once the playoffs start. So I like Calvary again this week. Uh, so with Calvary, they playing Holy Trinity Episcopal. Um, um, they actually have a good record. I believe they're sitting at seven and two. They're just uh, they actually remind me they're very very young. Um, they got a sophomore quarterback who's who, who who's pretty good. Sixteen touchdowns, about two interceptions. Um, about little guy five eleven one seventy five. He has about eight hundred yards rushing. Um, ran for eight seventy five last season as a freshman. Um, so, you know, they got a nice quarterback. They got a good running game um, who's led by a sophomore as well. So they got two sophomores. I want to say he's at about 800 yards rushing. So they are a dangerous team, um, very young on both sides of the ball. It is crazy because on both sides of the ball, they have freshmen and sophomores that are that are good. Um, they got a freshman, Dean Lyman. He has about um, three – no, he's a linebacker um, named uh, Gibson. He has about 60 tackles, three sacks. They got about four or five. They got about four guys with at least five sacks. So um, they are a strong team, that, but they're young. Uh, they're not ready for somebody like Calvary. Calvary, 350 points on the season. Um, and I think they, you know, they get off pretty fast. So they're going to probably rest everybody if possible. Um, but I, I see them, um, Holy Trinity Episcopal, as good as they are, they're just not ready for Calvary, man. So, um I see Calvary winning this one as well. Uh, even when you look at Calvary, people like Kono, he's been resting this season, but he's still averaging 90 yards rushing. And, um, you know, this is somebody who has not been getting the ball as much as some of these other healthier backs. So um, that just comes to show you that Calvary, they're, they're getting their bodies playoff ready. So I like Calvary on this one as well. Um, Largo and Northeast, what you think about that one? Wow. Um, <clears throat> I think this one's going to be – uh, good matchup. Both teams are um, loaded on the defensive side of the ball. Um, both teams are very aggressive. Um, good linebacker play. Solid secondaries on both squads. 
Um, I think this one is going to come down to which offense can move the ball against uh, the defense. You know, will Largo be able to move the ball against Northeast defense and will Northeast, you know, vice versa? Will Northeast be able to move the ball against Largo's defense? So um, both teams are solid, you know, and this game can go either way. Um, you know, I'll be excited to see who comes out um, with this one. I think Largo is, uh, is a little more um, battle tested. Um, I think they have uh, just a little more talent defensive wise um, because they're a more veteran group. Um, but from the standpoint of both teams being solid on defense, um, you can definitely say that both teams are solid on defense. So um, uh, I think that uh, yeah. I, I like Margo in this one, though. All right. Um so this is the thing about this. Largo and Northeast played twice last year. Largo beat them both times last game of the season and also in the playoffs the following week. Um, so Northeast, the, these teams are very familiar with each other. Um, Northeast wants that get back, of course. So they got a little bit, you know, it's hard to beat a team, good team twice. Three times it, it, it is very hard. But uh, this is Largo. They're a great team. You know what I'm saying? So, um. You know, it's a more experienced team with the same players on both sides. So, of course, you, with Northeast with more experience, you got Largo with more experience. And these guys, you know, you got McCluster, Hayes, Thomas. These are experienced um, players, man. Peterson, he's 113 yards away from 1,000. So, I'm expecting him to be running hard. Um, but he's going to be needed on the receiving end as well. Uh, we need a big game from Thomas, man, because Northeast wants to go into these playoffs hot. Like I said, they came out unexpectedly and scored 48 points on a good um, on a good P part defense. Um, Worley has, I think, eight touchdowns, two interceptions in the last three games. You got McKenzie, he's hot. We talked about him in one of our reels. Um, so I think it's really going to come down to special teams. And when you look at both of their special teams, they have um, they got two pretty good kickers. Um, Northeast kicker not as good as Largo's, but um, if Northeast could show up on special teams like they did last week, because they showed up big, um, it, it, it could be a close game. But um, ah, this it, it's gonna be close. It, it's it's a pick 'em it, to me. It's a pick 'em, man, because Northeast is go is coming to bang. They come in. They come into play. You know what I'm saying? Ain't no resting, Largo. Ain't no resting. Ain't no doing nothing. Both of these teams coming, you know what I'm saying, with their hats on. So um, this, this is going to be – hopefully they can save some juice for the playoffs, both of them, honestly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so this, to me, this is a pick em game, man. So I'm, I'm a, yeah, I, I don't even really know where to pick. Yeah, definitely can be a pick em. Yeah, man. And um, so next we got uh, Give St. Pete. Um you know, I don't ever want to treat Gibbs, you know, you know, like they just, you know, because they got talent. They they got the talent to beat anybody just like Lakewood. They could show up any day. Um, they, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is the type of game where, you know, we looking for Jeff Jones to get that 2K. But Gibbs has speed. Gibbs has, they hungry. They got speed. And I know they're hungry to not let him get that 2K. Um, right. I don't think they're hungry enough to beat them, but um, you know, I, I don't know. Jones, two hundred eight yards away. Um, you know, St. Pete has a great. De they, I ain't gonna say great, but solid defense. Um, Ducksworth is an up and coming running back and receiver. You know, St. Pete to me has the better team. I just don't know whether Jones is gonna get that two K. I like to see him get it. But uh, and we all know I think you know playoffs they count stats as well. So if he doesn't get it this week, I think they're still going to count his stats towards the season anyway. So right. um, you know that two K is probably inevitable. Um, but I like St. Pete. Yeah, um, I, I like St. Pete as well. Um, Gibbs they've been a little banged up um, just because the lack of talent. Not from the standpoint they had a lack of talent, but just I think the talent that they do have they go both ways, you know, and they play a lot of snaps, you know, the, the, they, and, um, you know, once they get worn down, it kind of shows that the talent starts to, to dissipate a little bit. So if they can't jump out on St. Pete early and get a good lead and have something to kind of play for, I think that kind of 
you know, that's the, the monkey that kind of jumps on their back and then it kind of just snowballs and goes downhill. And with Jeff being a, a, a nemesis on the return game and at a quarterback position, I just think he'll be a little too much for Gibbs to handle, man. And um, so I like St. Pete in this one. Right, right, right. Cool, cool. So um, next we got uh, Indian Rocks, Tarpon Springs. Um, this is going to actually be the last game for Tarpon Springs. They're actually not in the, um, in the district. So this is going to be the last game for Parkes Harris. Mm. Um, I expect him to want to go out with a bang, you know what I'm saying, as a senior. Um, Jeremiah Port, I want to say, is a senior as well. So man, this this is uh this is their last game, man. And um I'm assuming they're gonna want to go out with a bay, man. Porter and Harris combined 2,300 yards over, over 2,300 yards on the season. Um, you know, good special teams. Um, I, I expect all facets of their game, man, to be smooth as they go out, you know what I'm saying? So um Indian Rocks, they're a good team. Um, they got this this underclassman who who I've been watching a lot lately, Anthony Cavallaro, 6'5, 190. Um, only played four games this year with seven sacks. Mm. Um <laughs> and like I say, he's a freshman, 6'5. You know what I'm saying? So he's somebody to watch him and um him and uh Holloway from Lakewood, two big guys. Oh yeah, who, who I love um as underclassmen. So shout out to them. But um I, I, you know, Indian Rocks is going into the playoffs. I want them to go in hot, but Tarpon Springs is finna bring it, man. This is their last game. I, this is their championship. I expect Tarpon Springs to come hard, man. And I would not be surprised if they come hard enough to blow Indian Rocks out, even though Indian Rocks is a good team. I'm not taking that from them, but Tarpon, this is their championship. This is it. Yeah. And this, uh, you know, uh, congratulations to the season they had. Hats off to all the young men that fought through um, and played their butts off. Um, it's just, you know, I hate that they don't have a chance to continue to go uh, a little further and, and see how far they can go. Because, you know, any team that goes, you know, eight and one, nine and one uh, in this, you know, in this area is a team that's bound for success. And um, I've seen Tarpon Springs get better each, you know, week in and week out. So, um, you know, like I said, I just hate that, you know, this is the end. But, you know, job well done to those guys. And um, even though it may be the last game in high school, um, a lot of you guys have bright futures at the next level. So congratulations on that as well. Um, you put yourselves in a good position to go play on somebody's uh, – you know, be on a, a division, you know, college collegiate level roster next year. Um, and again, I just think um, because of the talent that they have, because of the, like you said, they, this being their last game, of course, they're going to want to go out with a bang and have, you know, this one to remember for for a lifetime. So I like Tarpon Springs as well in this one. And um, of course, you know, um, and recently we all know, um, FACA, they voted on the All Star game, so I'm pretty sure we'll see uh, Parkes Harris in that game. Uh, Jeremiah Porter, we'll probably see them in the All Star game, hopefully. Um, so I, I anticipate that. Uh, yeah. Next up, we we got P Park versus Seminole. Uh, P Park coming off a tough loss against Northeast um, last couple of weeks. Been been tough for P Park. Um, I saw some things when I saw them play against St. Pete that, you know, it, it just seems like they, they kind of wore down a little bit. Um, they they are good. They are good. But I think that they could play better than what they've been playing at. Um, of course, triplets been showing up. I can't. Triplets a dog. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, he, he's playing with some dog. Everybody's showing up. Uh, we just, you know, I just think they could definitely play better than what they're playing. Um, so hopefully they could just sharpen their iron against Seminole. Um, right now it's looking like they might play Jesuit in the playoffs. So, uh, you know, you know, this, you know, hopefully they could just go out here, rest up, do what they need to do. Um, but, uh, you know, P part, I, you know, I'm, you know, I expect to see them at six and four after this and um, they have the talent to do a lot of big things. They just, they, it just has to continue to gel like it did at the beginning of the season and, uh, and, and keep showing up. So I expect P-Part 
to win this one, but I also expect Seminole to play their hardest. You know what I'm saying? August, San you know, um, Coach Sanchez is not one of those type of coaches that's going to let his team just lay down. So um, I'm expecting Seminole to come out hard, but I'm expecting P Park to get the win. Yeah, P Park, um, of course, I'm alumni, so I'm going to be biased. Um, but, um, you know, from the standpoint, just like you said, it's been a long season for for all of the young men out there and um, a lot of bumps, a lot of bruises, a lot of um, drag out uh, knockout type games that Pinellas Park has played. And um, I know it's not easy um, to, to come in and be prepared um, to play a team that, that want to knock you off or prove that uh, they're a better team. So, um, you know, the resilience of Pinellas Park um, you know, those guys always do a good job of, of bouncing back. Um, Seminole, they had their success, and then they kind of went on the little, you know, hit some bumps in the road. Um, but I, I believe this will be a good game. Um, I like P Park in this one. And, um, you know, like you said, uh, P Park, hopefully you guys can get back on the winning track right before you head into um, the postseason. Right, right, right. Definitely, man. Okay. And uh, we got number one CCC going against Cardinal Gibbons. How you feel about this game? Man, this one is going to be uh, – this was going to definitely be a, a good game. Um, when when um, Cardinal Gibbons played Northeast, it was close. And then um, just like I figured, uh, Cardinal Gibbons came in and uh, was a different team in the second half. Um like I said, I know the coach really well. He was my the head coach was my wide receivers coach in college. Um, I still talk to him from time to time, and he's always looking for a challenge. Um, you know, these young men um, that you know, it's just this would be a, a test for CCC. Uh, I'm gonna say that, and not only from the fact that uh, they playing a good team, but they traveling down to Cardinal Gibbons and. Um, we all know when Pinellas County teams travel down south, it's it's a whole nother different atmosphere. Um, and you know, CCC be ready not only to play against the players, but just not saying anything about the calls and the refs or anything. But just make sure you guys are uh, come to play fundamentally sound ball um, because you may not get the calls, but you, you get back in the huddle and, and you you get back and run the play. Um, run it again and, and 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 show that hey, no matter what you guys try to throw against us, we we here for um, to you know um, we here to fight. So it's gonna be a tough one, man. This this could be a pick 'em as well, man. Um, I, I like CCC, but just that on the road tough environment is gonna be um, a task for them as they they travel down to Fort Lauderdale. So not only do they you know three and a half four hour ride down south. But then you got to get yourself up for a game after a long bus ride. So um, we'll see how this one plays out. I, I think this is a pick em for me. All right, man. So um, you got Cardinal Gibbons. They got this kid, Michael Merger, North Carolina commit. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Six foot three, 200. Last three games, nine touchdowns, no interceptions. Um, did a lot of research on him, man. Um, five receivers over 200 yards. Um, defense is six players with at least one interception. You got four players with over, I think, four sacks, five sacks. Um, it is it's gonna be is it's gonna be tough. Um, it's gonna be tough. Um, they they're not Venice or anything like that, but uh, right, right, right. you know they have a lot of prospects. But uh, of course, we got CCC. You know, we got three receivers over two hundred. We got Caleb Goodloe. 430 yards, five touchdowns for the year. Um, Keo Jenkins is really showing up. Him and Tariq um, Harris, Johnny Richardson, those guys, the defense is showing up. That's really what CCC needed was um, they needed some type of um, – they needed something on that line. They needed some some something because, I mean, of course they have the DBs, but they really needed some pressure on that line, man, which, I, you know, I think has really helped them out. And it's helped people like, you know, of course, because we're used to, you know, last year we saw Hefe and uh, Rich, you know, these are guys with almost 
if not, they both had over 100 tackles, if not close to it. So um, that just lets you know they were making a lot of tackles, man. People are getting out of that backfield. But with uh, Jenkins and um, these other guys, they've really helped out a lot. Um, it's going to be a tough game. You know what I'm saying? This is this is a game that I hope that, um, you know, like, you know, CCC, they've been sharpening an eye the last couple of weeks. And, and and this is the type of game, you know, this is a, might be the type of game that they need. You know what I'm saying? They might not face anything tougher than this outside of Shamanah Madonna when they, you know, go through the playoffs. So um, this is, you know, this is a good warm up for them. I think they could come out um, on top. Um, it's just going to be tough. It's going to be one of them games where um, they're going to need everybody. They go, you know, they're going to need Stevens. You know, I know, you, but we all know that, you know, uh, Newton, man, hey, games like this, he likes to put that ball, he likes to put run that thing and pass it. He likes to put the team on his back. Uh, but I love to see them share that rock, man. Stevens get some big yards. Uh, Trey get in there, do some big things. Uh, Caleb and uh, Rigby really show up like they can because these are two guys, man. They, these are two guys, if used properly, man, they could be, they, they could really be the difference in the playoffs for you guys. So um, I like CCC, but it is definitely a picking game, man. It's definitely a picking game. Um, And last but not least, whoo. Um, yeah, this one. I didn't know Venice was loaded like this. Um, yeah, Venice stay loaded. I didn't know. Um, on top of, they got Chris Lee from CCC leading them. 88 tackles. He transferred from CCC this year. Got 88 tackles. Um. Man, he 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 he's doing his thing. Um, man, they I mean, four backs over two hundred yards rushing, four receivers over three hundred yards receiving. Um, they got your, your Jane, boy. Jane Glass of Central Michigan commit. Um, seventeen touchdowns, two picks. Um, you know he can run if needed, but he 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 he's a big strong kid like Sean. I mean, like you know, like Newton. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So you're playing that type of player. Uh, but the defense is just crazy, man. They got um, – they defense, five players with two or more sacks. Uh, like I say, Chris Lee, they've only lost to Armwood and Coco, two state contending teams. Um, so, you know, but this is CAI. Uh, they got backups, man, uh, D1 prospects. You cannot take nothing away from CAI. They have backups that are D1 prospects that we have not seen yet. <clears throat> Every week I'm seeing these coaches raving about a new prospect that I haven't even heard of. You know what I'm saying? So I can't take, you know, they, they beat Lakeland. They did what they're supposed to do. They are the type of team that steps up to their competition. You know what I'm saying? They have that type of ability. They have the type of D lineman, man. Like I say, Seven Lawn is a dog, but he playing next to some dogs too. Um, Dallas Sims, 6'3", 190, Minnesota commit. Um, over the last three games, 300 yards. You know what I'm saying? Receiving. Um, you got Kiara James at linebacker, Maryland commit, 107 tackles. Tavari Wilson, sophomore, four interceptions. He's been showing up big the last two years. So Venice has as many dogs as them. If I mean, CAI has as many dogs as them, if not more. Venice just has – some maybe a few more experienced dogs, but I mean, man, CAI has it. Any team has it. This is a pick em for me. Um, the atmosphere is going to be tough for CAI, but this is what they do. They travel. These kids came from Canada. Um, this is what they came to do. We get a big game out of Raymond. It, 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 it's over, man. So I'm expecting that O-line. It, it's going to really come down to who can handle that line. I'm expecting CAI to show up. I'm expecting them to win. Um, against a tough Venice team, and um, this is their championship. This is another team that's freelance, so they just like Tarpon. This is their game, man, so these kids are going to step up. Yeah, um, I'm surprised you didn't mention for Venice, man. Um, I don't know if you knew, but uh, they also have five-star uh, defensive back Charles Lester III. He uh, transferred, mm -hmm. came from uh, Sarasota and, and, tra uh, and uh, transferred down to Venice. So uh, secondary is loaded. Um, defense, like you say, is, is humming, swarming to the ball, um, making plays. Uh, CAI as well. Um, big time game. This this game will be full of uh, loaded with 
Division One prospects. Um, I know the house is going to be rocking. Um, they've built this game up, and so CAI be prepared for uh, a packed house, a rowdy environment, all the nine. I, I mean, I wish I can be down there, um, the, the, you know, to be in that atmosphere um, to see what, what that game is going to be like. Um, but like you said, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come down to which team can make the least amount of mistakes, and then if CAI can overcome – the environment of, you know, where they are. Don't let the pressure get to them. Um, just play CAI, CAI ball and um, they, they should be all right. Um, I think they're equally, equally talented, um, you know, matchup. Um, and so uh, again, this is a pick them just because, you know, both teams are talented and it can go either way. So. All right. Cool, 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 man. Well, that's, that's our top 10, man. That's our top 10. And um, before we go, we go uh, get to some final thoughts. Um, for me, um, I want to give a shout out to Broton Coleman out of Osceola. Three years straight, 100 tackles. Um, awesome. You know what I'm saying? Just does not have that Darius Hayes size. But um, three years straight, we've been watching this kid, man, um, dominate at linebacker for Osceola. So he's at 109 tackles this year. Um, his career high, um, and with one more game to go. So um, just shout out to him. Shout out to uh, Parkes Harris, another thousand yard year before he goes out. Um, you know, you know, I hate to see them boys not being able to make the playoffs, but um, just a, you know, he's one of those kids, man. Over the career, he he's done a great job, along with people like I say, uh, Darius Hayes, uh, Drackett. You know, you 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 got you got some of these kids, man, that are going out with some with some top notch careers, man. But um, I definitely wanted to give a shout out to um Mr. Coleman, man, because that's that's a special thing to do in high school is get over a hundred tackles, but to do that three years in a row, um, at the size that he's at, because we're talking about five eight five nine, um, it, that that's amazing, man. So I wanted to give a shout out to them, man, and um, uh, I'm just looking forward to all the teams playing um, playing this week, man, and figuring out whether, you know, these playoff games are going to be what it is and getting on with it. Um, shout out to Mr. Potter over there. Keswick Chris, he got 10 sacks. He's one of our sack leaders. Um, yeah, shout out, shout out to, uh, shout out to those guys. What you, what you got, Grant? Um, yeah, shout out to all the seniors, man. Um, you know, for those guys who's not going on to the postseason, man, you guys had a heck of a, you know, career. Um, and hopefully you guys can continue playing ball at the next level for any of those guys that's looking for help uh, that to, to try to get, you know, their the names out there and try to play at the next level. You can always hit us up, hit me up, um, and we'll try to help you guys um, with finding schools and, and trying to get you guys to the next level. Um, also, shout out to uh, – you know, Lakewood, they have, even though they're not in our top 10, they got a huge game. Um, if Shamadad isn't number one in the nation, they they very well could be. They playing um, Shamadad this week. Um, you know, they're going to have to wrestle and, and deal with the number one player in the in the uh, country, and Jeremiah Smith, also five-star uh, JoJo Trader, um, a Miami commit. Uh, oh, um, Jeremiah Smith is an Ohio State um, commit. And they're just loaded. And I think the running back is committed to uh, uh, North Carolina. So just athletes all around the board. Safety, uh, Zaquan Patterson, he's a Miami commit. So Lakewood's going to have their hands full. Uh, that's another game. If you're in the south side area of St. Pete or south side Pinellas County, if you want to watch, go watch some big time ball, uh, that may be a game that you may want to check out. But just other than that, man, um, you know, it's almost – kind of somber to know that uh, some of these young men will be playing their last game uh, this week. You know, this actually, uh, you know, Friday, some of those guys who may not have the aspirations or dreams to go play in, at the next level in college, you know, will be suiting up for the last time. So, you know, with that being said, guys, soak it all in, enjoy it, you know, play the game, you know, literally as if it's your last uh, time. And uh, man, just relish 
all the memories you can uh, with your teammates, with your coaches, all those long practices, the sweat, the tears, everything that you put into the game. Uh, make sure you give it back on Friday, um, you know, for, you know, all the hard work and things that you guys did over the last four years. Um, you know, you definitely want to go out on top, you know, and finally, um, shout out to coach, man, for, for coming on, man. I learned a lot from him, man. Uh, you know, real good guy, I can tell. And um, y'all make sure y'all tap in with uh, T, what is it, TC3. Um, you know, if you guys need that extra help, those guys who's planning on going into college and playing, you know, at the next level, that's a, a way right there to start honing in on those skills and, and um, working some things, um, some of those weaknesses that you need to kind of get cleaned up before you head to the next level. So make sure you tune in and, and, and you know, tap in with him. So, but again, man, shout outs to uh, Totem Pole Nation for allowing us to be on here. Um, all the fans that tuned in tonight, those who ask questions, you guys are the reason why we do what we do. And man, the show wouldn't be what it was had you not uh, rocked with us tonight. So we appreciate you. All right. And um, shout out um, to another person, uh, Andre Hall Jr. Um, he's went out there to New Mexico Military Institute. This is somebody who played for Bogey Siega, who, of course, everybody knows who his father is. So, you know, they, we, you know, Obviously, he has some potential, man, and he's went out to New Mexico military and took off um, over, I think he's at about 1,200 all-purpose uh, playing receiver out there uh, with a couple more games to go. So he's went up there and lit it up, got his first D1 offer this week, I want to say from Arkansas Pine Bluff. So um, he's a great example of somebody who did not get the stats at Bogan. Uh, probably a lot of people counted him out. But um, it was, you know, his father, you know, when I played, he played for Dixie, great stats. But he ended up going JUCO as well. And we all know the story. He went from JUCO to being one of the greatest running backs in USF history to, uh, you know, getting a couple of years in the NFL with the Broncos and a couple other teams. So, um, you know, this is a kid. He went at the New Mexico Military Institute, and he has flourished. All right. So shout out to Andre Hall, Jr., and um, we we will uh, we will holler at everybody next week. We got uh, Andy coming back, join us. We got uh, Trey Worley. We got my boy Trey Worley coming on, man. So um, he's gonna be coming on, joining us next week to talk with us a little bit about what Northeast has going on and how he feels about the playoffs. So uh, we'll be talking to Mister Worley and uh, my brother Andy Villamarzo. Um, who covers the state of Florida as far as football. So we'll talk to all you guys later. And uh, have a great night. All right, y'all. Be blessed.